Well guys, the time has come. Let's talk about it. Who's going to be and who should be the starting quarterback for the Michigan football program in 2022? Should it be Cade McNamara or J.J. McCarthy? Let's talk about it. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Anwar Yusef Dunbar, and this is Big Discussions 76 Sports. First of all, please like this video, please share it, and please subscribe to my channel. If you want to throw something in the tip jar, that information is below in the description box. And also, please consider joining the Big Words LLC uh, newsletter. I'm not just a YouTube content creator, I'm also a writer with two blogs, and I'm working on a book project that's related to sports. So uh, you'll hear more about that on this channel in the near future. However, let's get back to the, uh, the maize and blue Michigan football. Um, you know, I've been, I've been, well, we were speculating on it the entire 2021 season. Uh, who's going to be the starter uh, the next two years? Uh, is it going to be Cade McNamara? Uh, is he going to retain the job, or is it going to be our um, our young upstart phenom, uh, J.J. McCarthy? And I, I thought that I would be able to jump into this, uh, you know, immediately or sometime after our season-ending loss to uh, the Georgia Bulldogs in the national semifinal. But uh, as you know, some other things transpired that uh, warranted our attention. So now uh, that the coaching staff is in place and Jimbo is back and re-signed, let's, uh, let's start talking about this now uh, because this is going to be a part of the, um, the, the discussion leading up to the 2022 season. And uh, let's just jump into it now. By the way, th I want to thank everyone who supported, I'm sorry, everyone who supported my uh, post uh, Georgia uh, live stream. I think a lot of SEC fans and Georgia fans came in and watched that. And uh, that that stream got up to a couple thousand views. Uh, I, I guess it's good when Michigan loses. <laughs> but, um, I, I, you know, I, I want to encourage fans from the other conferences, if you're an SEC fan, if you're a Georgia fan, um, if you're from the Pac-12 or the ACC and you've come to this channel and you like the vibe and you like uh, the way I analyze these things, please hit that subscription button. Uh, my next milestone is, um, uh, I think right now I'm at 1,078 subs. The next milestone is 1,100 subs. So I'm open to discussing more SEC content and uh, and uh, collaborating with SEC or Pac-12 or, or uh, ACC uh, content creators. So if uh, if you're new here and you liked what I did and if you like what I do, please hit that subscription button and please like the content. And uh, with that, let's jump into the question. Who is going to be the starter for next season and who should be the starter for uh, the next season, which is the 2020 to season. So all of us thought that the 2021 season would be a quote-unquote rebuilding year, and, and I think a lot of us thought, especially 
uh, once Ronnie Bell went down, then uh, we would really have a crippled offense for uh, the 2021 season, and especially with uh, the way that the passing game looked uh, early, uh, it just you know it just didn't look like uh, it would turn out the way that it turned out. But I think uh, the offensive line and Hassan Haskins had a lot to do uh, with the way things turned out. But all along, I think we were looking for uh, more explosive quarterback play. And so Caden McNamara was under scrutiny for much of the season. Why wasn't he making <clears throat> the downfield throws? Uh, was he uh, waiting too long to throw receivers open? Uh, did he miss completions down the field? Um, and, and why didn't our offense, why didn't our offensive passing game have a, a level of explosiveness throughout the season? In any case, I think Cade found a rhythm uh, at some point. I think he had to figure out how to be the full-time starter uh, after losing our our senior a wide receiver and and uh, those kinds of things, uh, and I think there's a natural progression for most players playing that position. But all along, throughout the season, we saw Jimbo and our departed uh, offensive coordinator Joshua Gaddis putting in our phenom, our freshman phenom. You know, all along, I was wondering, okay, why do they keep putting this kid in? Why do they keep putting this kid in? Why do they? Why do they keep taking our starter out to give this kid some reps? Are they going to switch Cade out? Is, is Cade in danger of losing his job? But each time JJ got a few steps, Jimbo put Cade back in. And, um, you know, Cade seemed to have that for what he lacked in terms of making all the plays. He didn't turn the ball over in general. Uh, he had a, uh, a steady and methodical way about him. Uh, Cade was able to stand in there even when the pocket was collapsing and, and, and complete passes. And he rallied the team back um, on opponents' fields. I'm thinking about Nebraska and Wisconsin. And we know that the, <laughs> the Michigan State game uh, slipped away from us. But I'm saying that to say that he seems to have the, the non-measurables that you would want in a quarterback. The, the pocket presence, the leadership prowess and the ability to stay in there uh, and stare down the gun barrel. That was a term they used when Kurt Warner won his first Super Bowl. So he has the, the seeming ability to stay in there and complete the pass even when the pocket is collapsing, which is what you want. However, we also know that our phenom, our now sophomore phenom quarterback, has the measurables. He's two inches taller. He seems to have more zip on the ball and he's more mobile, or mobile. So all along, in my mind, this reminded me of Tom Brady versus Drew Henson. I got to Ann Arbor for Tom Brady's senior season. Drew Henson was a sophomore, and as we all know from the story, uh, Tom in his senior year had to fight off Drew Henson for that job. Um, <clears throat> early on, Lloyd Carr went with the platoon system where he'd um, start one guy, Tom Brady, for the first quarter. He let Drew Henson have the second quarter. And then he'd go with the hot guy for the second half. Now, eventually, Lloyd saw, it was after the Michigan State game against Nick Saban's Michigan State Spartans, Lloyd saw that Tom was the leader of the team and he had that, um, he had that it despite Drew Henson's uh, physical uh, abilities and Tom was the starter for the remainder of the season and many of us feel like if Tom had started the entire season uh, without the platoon system Michigan might have gone to the BCS championship game that season so the question is for these two guys and unlike Tom and Drew who are two classes apart JJ and Cade I believe are one class apart so there's less there's less room there to let Cade play out another season while JJ sits tight and, and waits. So, you know, either it's a little more complicated than Tom Brady and Drew Henson in terms of 
where their their um, their classes, the separation of their their classes. Uh, so it, it's it's a it's a much more interesting situation. So that's how Tom Brady and Drew Henson played out. Drew eventually got the job when Tom graduated. We know what happened. He went to play baseball. But now the question is, what's going to happen with J.J. McCarthy and Cade McNamara? Um, will Cade hold him off for another year? Or will J.J. get in there in the in spring camp and over the summer and outplay him and snatch the job? And then if he does snatch the job, does Cade uh, transfer or does he stay? Now, you can't have uh, this discussion in its entirety without uh, taking a look at uh, both Cade's and uh, JJ's stats from uh, this past uh, 2021 season. So I've gone to ESPN and uh, pulled up their, their stats, and I'm going to go through them really, really quickly. You can go to ESPN yourself if you want to take a look. Uh, but also keep in mind... As I go through these, they're not equal in terms of uh, playing time or snaps. Cade got the majority of the snaps during the 2021 season, and uh, JJ came in periodically uh, to uh, give uh, opposing defenses. I'm sorry, he came in periodically to give opposing defenses a different look and to put that extra dimension on the field that he. Uh, brought to the table. So, you know what? I'll start with the 2020 stats. Let's just go all the way back for for Kate. So we know that in the uh, the bizarre 2020 shortened season, uh, Cade spelled uh, Joe Milton, and then Cade came back out after he hurt a shoulder against uh, Penn State. So that that season, Cade completed 43 of 71 passes for a 60. 0.6 uh, uh, completion percentage. He threw for 425 yards for an average of six yards uh, per throw. He threw for five touchdowns, zero interceptions, and his longest uh, completion was 46 yards. He was not sacked during that time. During the 2021 season, remember, he started off slow. His number one target got hurt, and um, it just wasn't clear how this would all go uh, early on, and it, and it didn't look very good early on. So for the season, Cade completed uh, 210 of 327 uh, passes uh, for a 64.2% uh, completion percentage. He threw for 2,576 yards for an average of uh, 7.9 yards per completion. He threw for 15 touchdowns, which... I think that's kind of in the middle of the pack. I think there are quarterbacks in um, the Power Five conferences who passed for more. Uh, he threw uh, six interceptions. His longest completion was 93 yards, and he was sacked 11 times. And he had, in terms of rushing, he um, ran uh, 37 times for uh, 26 yards for an average of .7 uh, yards per carry, and he carried, uh, uh, he, I'm sorry, he scored one touchdown, and his longest run was 20 yards. So remember, Cade uh, would would stay in the pocket until uh, the last minute to get the ball off, and he was always looking downfield, and uh, on occasion, he took off running. So he did have some mobility, but in general, he opted to stay in the pocket to look downfield. Now, in terms of J.J., and again, J.J. got in, you know, uh, he was sprinkled in uh, sporadically throughout the season to give uh, opposing defenses a different look and a different uh, threat. And as you recall, he finished off the Michigan State game because uh, I think Cade was in the tent, quote-unquote. Anyway, J.J. completed uh, 34 uh, of 59 passes for a completion percentage of 57.6. He threw for a total of uh, 516 yards for an average of 8.7 yards per throw. 
he threw uh, five touchdowns. He threw uh, two interceptions, and his longest completion was 69 yards. He was sacked three times, and he had a quarterback rating of 152.3. In terms of rushing, uh, J.J. Uh, rushed the ball uh, 27 times uh, for 124 yards for an average of 4.6 yards per carry. He scored two touchdowns, and his longest run was 23 yards. So we saw him put on the Jets at uh, different times uh, during the season, so we know that uh, he's mobile and he can uh, run. And I know that as a freshman, there were times when he got in there and he dropped back, and I was just hoping that he wouldn't throw an interception. But I will say that each time J.J. dropped back there, uh, you could see the velocity, and you could also see that there was a decisiveness in his throws. So I was, so I'm saying more oftentimes than not, he did make good decisions uh, back there in the pocket. Hey guys, I wanted to do one more thing, and that's a comparison of their uh, passer and quarterback ratings, uh, Cades and JJs. So it turns out there's a difference between the passer rating and the quarterback rating. Hey guys, work with me here. I played basketball. I was a basketball guy. I watched, uh, and I watch a lot of football, uh, but, you know, there are only some things you know cold turkey like many of you guys know, um, and that's if you played the game before. So anyway, so the passer rating, it turns out, that is a, um, a calculation involving all of the passing related statistics and the quarterback rating um, is the overall calculation of how the quarterback impacted the game not the, so that's not just the passing statistics but it's also the run plays the penalties the interceptions thrown all those different things the wins the losses all those different things so passer rating and quarterback rating so for the 2021 season Cade had a uh, passer rating of 141.9 and he had an overall quarterback rating of uh, 75.4. Now, J.J., in his uh, limited number of snaps uh, as Cade's understudy, he had a passer rating of 152.3 and a quarterback rating of 62. So an unfortunate uh, aspect of the quarterback position is that only one can play, uh, and in the long term, only one should play to give uh, a team a chance to win. Um, now, there have been instances where two quarterbacks have been played throughout the season. I just gave the example of Tom Brady, Andrew Henson, but also if you think back to Urban Meyer's Florida Gators, um, Herb split time between Chris Leak and Tim Tebow that first year when they, they won the BCS uh, National Championship uh, game over uh, the Senator Jim Trestle's uh, Ohio State Buckeyes. Uh, Chris Leak was the senior, um, the more experienced pocket passer, but Herb would regularly sub Tim Tebow in to run the ball and do that fullback thing that he uh, became known for. But what's um what's Jimbo going to do? Well, I think it's important to look back what Jimbo did back in San Francisco with Alex Smith and Colin Kaepernick. I think this with Kade and JJ is almost a mirror image of Alex Smith and Colin Kaepernick. I think um, <clears throat> Jimbo was able to get the most out of Alex Smith, who had had an up-and-down uh, NFL career at that point. So he was able to salvage Alex Smith. Uh, but I, I think once Jimbo saw Colin Kaepernick's ability to run around and also throw the ball, he, he kind of thought to himself, him and, him and his coaching staff said, okay, if we can get this kid on the field, he's got dimensions that Alex Smith doesn't have and once Alex Smith got hurt, he never saw the field again. <clears throat> Excuse me. He never saw the field again. And of course, of course, we know what happened. Cap 
had two to three good years before things went downhill. So um, we could see something similar here uh, if if Cade wins the starting spot <clears throat> and gets hurt, he may lose the job um, if you know JJ doesn't snatch it all together. But I think Jimbo and his coaching staff can see JJ's got a stronger arm, he's more mobile, um, and when when he's in there, the offense runs in a different way than it does with Cade. But how <clears throat> would JJ do in those um, late game situations on opposing fields? Will he turn the ball over? Will he, uh, uh, you know, not be able to keep the chains moving? Those kinds of things. So I'm saying this to say that I think that San Francisco showed us that Jimbo will opt towards the younger, faster, <clears throat> and more mobile quarterback if given the chance. In terms of the Harbaugh brothers, because I think we've, we've seen and we're seeing that there are some similarities between Jim and John. Well, John did the same thing, well, did a similar thing in Baltimore with uh, Lamar Jackson and Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco won him a Super Bowl. Uh, Joe Flacco was the grizzled old veteran. Um, but Joe Flacco arguably needed a nice offensive line and targets to, to throw to. Lamar Jackson was the the young uh, phenom upstart, strong arm, lots of mobility, and eventually he uh, snatched the job from Joe Flacco. So I think, again, the, in terms of the Harbaugh brothers, they tend to trend or lean towards the young mobile phenom quarterback. So we might see a similar thing uh, happen with Cade and J.J., So what do either of them bring to the table? Well, I mean, I kind of already described this, but uh, I think when Kate was in there, he showed a, a pocket presence. He showed a level of maturity. He showed a level of patience, a level of uh, poise late in the game on opposing fields. Uh, he showed that under most circumstances, he won't turn the ball over. Uh, but I think what we needed to see and what we're going to need to see going forward is his ability to put up points and throw receivers open and make the quote-unquote NFL throws. Um, so he's somewhat mobile. He can take off and run when uh, the defensive backs and the linebackers have run downfield and there are a few running lanes. He's shown that ability. But I think that what we're looking for, um, if he's going to be the starter, is for him to make those more aggressive throws uh, down uh, the field now um, and that having been the starter uh, for one year he's got that one year to uh, grow on now uh, in terms of JJ late in the season now we not now we had the fumble against Michigan State uh, and I think the, the story is that that was actually uh, Blake Corum who caused uh, that snafu um, but late in the season, in the national semifinal game against Georgia, and Georgia fan did point out that those were, uh, those plays were against Georgia's backups, but you saw the arm strength from J.J. You saw his ability to run around. You saw, uh, and even earlier in the season when he got in, he, you know, I was, I was praying when J.J. got in there, please don't turn the ball over, please don't make a, a, freshman, a freshman mistake, and aside from the Michigan State fumble, J.J., when he got in there, he confidently um, ran the ball. He confidently threw the ball. He confidently threw a couple of touchdowns. He confidently threw for first downs. So the ability and the confidence is there. But how, not having the experience, how will he do in those pressure situations? So I think that he obviously brings the upside and the physical tools, but... Um, in those game situations, he is unproven. Um, and I think it's going to be a difficult job for uh, the coaching staff to figure out which one to make the starter um, for the 2022 season.
So, I'm going to wrap this video up by asking you guys the question, who uh, will be the starter? Who should be the starter? Are you going to go with the experienced veteran? Or uh, would you go with the uh, young phenom? Um, I think that this will, this is the first of many times we're going to talk about this on uh, this channel. It's only, uh, you know, late February, early March. So uh, we have a whole spring and summertime to speculate on this. Um, unfortunately, only one kid can be the starter. And as the coaching staff, you, you at least want to have one capable backup in case your starter goes down. But, you know, kids are, uh, their dream is to go to the NFL. They're, they're, they want to play. So uh, a, a talented kid is not going to want to <clears throat> sit back and be the backup for any reason. Um, especially if he's not in the NFL getting paid uh, to be the backup. So, uh, let me know what you think in the comment section below. Uh, again, we're going to talk about this many, many more times. I just wanted to get this started. Uh, if you want to throw something in the tip jar, that information is below in the uh, description box. And also, please consider joining the Big Words LLC uh, newsletter. Go Blue! And as always, remember that your attitude determines your altitude. Take care, and I will talk to you the next time. Bye-bye.